I was in charge of doing my own introduction, so uh, I'm, I hope I'm humble enough to say it's going to be brief that uh, I've been at uh, UCLA now for about eight years. I started the men's health clinic there, and um, I came up with this idea when I went into urology. I trained as a microsurgeon and, and uh, sexual health expert, but I realized that that's such a big part of, of uh, men's health that I kind of backdoored into this idea of being a men's health specialist, and it's turned out to be a very big career pivot in some ways. My operating room is exactly the same. I still do vasovasostomies and vasoepididymostomies and a lot of IPPs and a lot of Peyronie surgery and varicoceles and all that stuff. But my clinic is basically chief complaint, doc, I want to live forever. What can you do for me? And I think it's because we uh, have positioned ourselves rightfully as the stewards of men's health and urology. And I said this at a talk years ago, I said, if you own the penis, you own the man. And what I mean for, by that from a healthcare system standpoint is that the majority of my practice is de novo to my system. And I'm coming from UCLA, which you know, has 3 million people uh, in its area. So we, uh, we, I still see a lot of guys that don't have primary care physicians. In fact, up to 70% of the patients that I see are coming to me from outside and only about 30% of them have primary docs. And so I actually end up being that gateway and out of that, of course, came this entire field of longevity. Now, the concept of longevity, we should, we should realize, we had our big Nobel Prize talk yesterday uh, that, uh, that got a little heated in terms of how many urologists actually won the Nobel Prize. Testosterone won the Nobel Prize in 1929. It was an Austrian and a Swiss uh, that shared it for being able to synthesize testosterone molecules. Uh, uh, the other guy that almost won the Nobel Prize was Sigmund Freud's doctor who did uh, something called a unilateral vasectomy to trap all of the man's spirit and make him live forever. And, and uh, Yeats actually went through that too. In fact, a lot of people say W.B. Yeats's poetry got better after he had the, the, the procedure, where it's essentially a unilateral vasectomy. And so that already is 100 plus years ago. Uh, prior to that, of course, we've still been trying to live forever. So what today's talk is going to be is as the stewards of men's health, if we can frame each other as that, is to figure out how much of this is podcast, poorly generated or none, no generated science and how much of it actually is legitimate and what if any of this has a future because a lot of novel therapies I think we've heard about, one of the ones that's getting a lot of press and I'm sure a lot of you have are shockwave machines, not just for the penis anymore. And there's some interesting data coming out on that and something else that we're very familiar with, hyperbaric oxygen, which we all have the indications of in the middle of the night and somebody comes in with uh, intractable hematuria and radiation cystitis, we all want to throw them in a chamber. Well, those guys, uh, there may be a lot more indication for doing hyperbaric in the future. So I'm going to start with an idea of what is aging at the cellular level. And I owe a little bit of this to, to a colleague and uh, a forced mentor, because uh, Dr. Jacob Rafer, who I have uh, has slowly been taking over his practice as he retires, is a legend in the field and, and doesn't think I need his mentorship, but he's one of the smartest men I've ever met. And uh, he taught me well into my career that aging begins at 25. And it does so with the, that is the year or the, the, the time in our lives for most men when we stop producing as much nitric oxide as we did. And so the jokingly way of referring to that is that not all of us are walking around with erections like we were in algebra class in 10th grade, right? But that is, that is our nitric oxide run amok. So unless I would ask for a show of hands, but that might be a little bit embarrassing, uh, but it doesn't happen to us anymore. Somewhere around 2025, we lose that unbridled gush of nitric oxide when you're thinking about quadratic equations. And so with that in mind, we have a, 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 bio, a biochemical marker for aging, senescence, and that is in the lighting cell. And our testosterone levels start to decline as we've learned so much from Dr. Walsh during this time, this, uh, these last couple of days. That happens much earlier than we think. That, that loss of nitric oxide signaling doesn't just affect our no reason erections in algebra class, but it actually starts to decrease our cardiac output appreciably by even our mid 20s. When we're gonna talk about aging today, we're gonna to talk about some molecules and we're gonna talk about the difference between what I can do as a physician and what patients can do. And so I've given a, a version of this talk very watered down in two very dis distinct uh, foci. One was to uh, groups of physicians 
I come in as kind of on their Wellness Wednesday and give a big talk about, hey, what can we do to take care of ourselves, physician, heal ourselves? And I'm talking to an incredibly fit audience here today because all of you guys are out there doing uh, your best, uh, living your best lives on the slopes, but not all physicians are as lucky. So with that in mind, there's this relationship that I always bring up, which is what can we do to break this down? And in my office, you're there for an hour a year. The rest of the time, you have control over your ex exercise, you have control over your nutrition, you have control over your sleep, you may or may not have control of your sex. A lot of guys have really good control over the sex, and every once in a while, that's with a partner too. Uh, you may also have purpose uh, that you need to think about, because one of the biggest things that kills us as we age is retirement. Retirement really does, in some ways, set the clock for early death if you don't have a purpose. So just remember that as, as those of us are getting closer to retirement age. And then we're going to talk about all the crazy stuff that may not be so crazy that, that you're going to see uh, your patients asking about. So this is sort of the, the molecular basis, and I'm not going to get too deep into the basic science. We don't have enough time, uh, and we're going to keep it fun. But there are some things out there that you should recognize. Anybody that's ever been on a transplant service knows what mTOR is. Uh, of course, TNF-alpha, maybe not a little bit more esoteric, but it's a critical signaler in Peyronie's disease, uh, and it's a key inflammatory marker. So high levels of TNF-alpha, not good. So all of these mechanisms we're going to look at to suppress TNF-alpha, we're going to talk about nitric oxide, I've hit it, COX-2, COX-2 inhibitors, and of course, uh, NAD, which is the hottest thing out there uh, right now in terms of what your patients are talking about. So let's stay out of the, the pharmacology for a second, and let's talk about the podcasts. So a couple things about infrared saunas, cold plunges. Um, anybody remember the uh, podcast and the, 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 uh, the, the journalism that came around testicular tanning last year? Anybody? Am I the only guy that, that, okay. So this was a great thing on Fox. It made Tucker Carlson that there was a study out of the 1930s where they had eight guys that would go out bare naked, sun themselves in the morning, and the next morning they got up, they drew testosterone levels and they were higher. So the conclusion out of these eight men was that putting your testicles in front of a, a sun source was going to boost your testosterone. Again, 1930s, right? So that was a couple years after the Nobel Prize. We knew testosterone was important, uh, and we were already figuring out how to naturally boost it through testicular tanning. So there are actually infrared tanning booths made just for the nutsack, and something to think about. Your pain. I had, within a day after that came out, and it takes a long time to get an appointment with me, after a day that that, that whole article came out, quoting what I would call bro science, which was based on a number of eight uh, guys in 1936, saying, Doc, can I get a testicular tanner? So um, after I sold him his with money back guarantee and started him on testosterone replacement therapy, his T levels shot up through the roof. It was amazing. So a uh, very entrepreneurial thought for your uh, practice. So sauna actually works. Sauna has very good data. The Finns have been doing it for centuries. Uh, and it actually downregulates a lot of heat shock proteins uh, and is very anti-inflammatory. Why is infrared better than regular? It isn't. It's exactly the same. It's just that the infrared exposure times can be longer. So maybe there's a little bit of a signal, which is why uh, podcasts are always talking about infrared saunas. You can buy them for your house now that are about the size of you. So they're very individualized and they're a couple thousand bucks. You can buy them at Costco, for goodness sake. So saunas are going to have a huge resur resurgence in the United States again. And, uh, and there may be some data behind it. So I'm not going to say no. What about cold plunging? So cold plunging, all the athletes do it. Uh, one of the hats I wear is being a team physician for the Lakers and the Dodgers, uh, just because of the relationship with UCLA. And, uh, and those guys, LeBron loves his cold plunge. His trainer is talking about how important it is. And again, it doesn't really have any data to support it. Other than if you're doing it uh, to improve your brown fat capacity, which is a cardiovascular fat. So that's the, the little bit of literature is that it can make your brown fat levels, just like Nordic swimmers will get that. That's very metabolic. So it actually can improve your insulin resistance uh, or decrease insulin resistance, improve your sensitivity. Then maybe cold plunges work, but it's actually the wrong thing to do after an intense workout because all of that ice destroys the inflammatory markers you need to actually heal wounds. And so most of the people are doing it right that are on podcasts. They get up in the morning, fresh out, of, uh, fresh out of bed, they jump in before their coffee, and they do their cold plunges. And there may be some data behind that. But again, I think it's, it's overused and, and understudied. So this is my new thing. So I, this is, it's 2024. And how many people have been hearing patients or, or uh, any of the longevity cast talk about hyperbaric oxygen? Is that a, is that a big thing yet? Yeah, so it's going to be big. Um, it's going to be big for a couple of reasons. One, because 
It's very commercial. There are a couple of outfits. Actually, there's up to five now dive commercial cosmetic dive chambers in, in uh, Los Angeles. There's an, a huge clinic in Israel called the Aviv Clinic that uh, is run by anesthesiologists. They have great data. It's an entire program where you go in. It's nutrition, exercise, and HPO. Uh, you go there for almost six weeks because HPO is not something you can do all at once. As we know, we have to dive them appropriately. But again, uh, I have a number of men in my practice that have home HBO chambers. And so I had to read about this and learn about it because they're doing it. So why is it good? Well, it's actually a very good stimulator of endothelial, uh, upregulation of endothelial cells, which then upregulates nitric oxide levels. There are some interesting data that in a post-prostatectomy model, we can prove uh, erectile function. So post-surgery for all our prostate nerve sparing guys out there, HBO uh, has pretty good and compelling uh, data that you can actually improve recovery of erectile function post nerve sparing prostatectomy. And there are multiple protocols coming out on that. And then again, it's a great way it, it, the molecule mTOR comes again. This is your, um, uh, your uh, magic drug that we'll get, I mean, magic receptor we're gonna get into in a second but it also uh, has a, um, a role in that uh, regulation. So shockwave therapy, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in it because I think a lot of people have adopted that for better or worse. SMSNA, which is our, one of our professional organizations, we're still kind of on the fence about whether we think it's bunk or not. But again, Lakers have two shockwave generators in their clinic, so in the orthopedic world, it's been out forever, and, uh, and it does have maybe some animal data that can improve angiogenesis and wound healing. So there are a lot of these clinics that are not just doing the penis anymore. And, and so something else to think about and understand. So I got this idea uh, a couple years ago too, that, that we, um, we spend a lot of time talking about how important it is in medical school to take vitamins. So we don't have vitamin C deficiency and vitamin D deficiency and neural tube defects. And all of that is because we're taking things to prevent. Uh, one of the things I got at Dr. Jarrett's lecture this morning is the risk of cardiovascular death has decreased dramatically. 47% of that, I believe the numbers, was for ph pharmacological intervention. We know that if you have a heart attack, you leave the hospital with a goodie bag of aspirin, beta blockers, et cetera, to prevent another heart attack. So we've been doing preventative pharmacology forever, especially if you have risk factors. We want to we'll get guys on statins to go down lower. But again, we're not even thinking about this from, we're thinking about this from a disease state, not from a wellness state. So I think the switch in our heads is we have to think about this from how do we promote a wellness state through uh, preventative pharmacology, even, even in the absence of cardiovascular risk factors. And, and I think that's the direction we're going to go. And so I think if you look at, you boil down to what our men are asking for in this realm, it's the idea of being proactive and not reactive. So why, if a guy comes into you, at 50 and says, I'm doing fine. I mean, I, you know, I'll get the erections I used to get. Uh, maybe at once a week, I'll wake up with an erection. Uh, you say, well, geez, there's a drug we can put you on that's cheap as water now uh, that may help prevent you from getting worse erectile dysfunction. I mean, we do that all the time now, right? So what else can we do that in? Uh, this is the idea that we have to promote, but it doesn't work for everybody. Nitric oxide depletion is not the only reason why guys have erectile dysfunction. So we really still have to realize that a lot of this has to be personalized. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of the hot drugs in the marketplace now, just to give you just an overview. Sirolimus or rapamycin, that's of course what mTOR uh, works on in our transplant literature. We, we should be very familiar with this. Uh, it's a, it's a fascinating drug because essentially what it does when somebody takes rapamycin, is it induces a caloric restricted state. And we've known for 100 years that calorie restriction leads to longevity, not only in, in murine models, but also in, in higher mammalian models and, and probably in humans too. But it's really hard to walk around on a 600 calorie diet. And then who wants to live forever if you're eating 600 calories a day? But sirolimus, rapamycin, actually can simulate to the body a caloric restricted state. What else can do that, and we'll get into that in a little bit too, is semaglutides, right? So these GLP-1 agonists, this is gonna be the future. We all have to get very familiar with this. We were thinking about on uh, Dr. Davis's checklist, and I'm sure in, uh, in Houston, they probably have a few guys on Ozempic. I'm not sure, but I've been down there, and, uh, and definitely uh, it's a different population than what I see in, in Santa Monica, and I still have a lot of guys on, on uh, GLP agonists in Santa Monica. It causes a massive gastroparesis, and so I had a guy two weeks ago, came in for an, uh, a penile implant revision, 
who stopped it two weeks ago and he still had a belly full of pizza and had to cancel the case. Uh, so we have to realize that from an anesthesia checklist, make sure you know that uh, what their semaglutide status is and that they've, um, they've been able to empty and stop it in, in time for pre-op because we'll get cases canceled. Um, very interesting though, the data around it. Metformin, again, something we've known about forever. This is another very safe drug, very few side effects that has been attributed to everything from decreasing cancer progression uh, because of the, the hypoglycemic state that you put in, cancer loves sugar, as I tell my guys. And, and if you can go on metformin, maybe you can reduce that glycemic load. Wall Street Journal article yesterday said that glucose is the new uh, gluten, and everybody now has to be on a severe hypoglycemic diet because that's the newest great thing to drive our blood sugars down. Maybe some truth to that. In erectile dysfunction literature, going on low doses of metformin, like 250 to 500 a day, uh, can improve endothelial function pretty dramatically. Methylene blue, I mean, what's up with that? That's another thing. If you look at some of these longevity pharmacies, we'll talk about that in a sec. So the, uh, the mTOR inhibitors, I was saying, introduced this, uh, the CR state, the caloric restriction state. Uh, it's also really interesting in the myocardium. It can stop apoptosis of the myocardium. So if you start somebody on sirolimus that already has cardiovascular damage, and these are human data, not just murine, uh, you can reverse some of the cardiomyopathies that we see and uh, so that's very interesting, right? Now, I was telling one of my transplant, Jeff Fields, one of our transplant surgeons, uh, when we were, I was talking about some of my new anti-aging crazy ideas that I'm coming up with, and he said, yeah, it's really, it was great, but we stopped using that in most guys because it drip, jacks up your cholesterol levels really high. So this gets back to the idea of personalized medicine. So you, you can't just put everybody in your office on sirolimus uh, because there are significant side effects. Also, the immunosuppression properties, why we use it for for transplant reasons, it, uh, it can cause increase in fungal infections and some of the other things that some of the uh, oral hypoglycemics can do. So you have to be careful, but at the doses that a lot of anti-aging people are recommending, you're not going to see that. Now, on the other hand, the other problem is we really have very poor human data on this because whatever you do when you're 30, we're not going to know if it works for 70 years, right? If you think I'm going to live to 100 when I'm 30, how do we know if sirolimus is going to work? So most of the data is driven out of one or two labs on the, the sirolimus, and uh, we don't really have great, great life extension. So proceed with caution if you're going to do that. But metformin, I think a lot of us are using it. A lot of our oncologists are using it because of the, the tumor suppression nature, especially in metastatic disease. And so I think that's a very safe drug. I have a lot of them in my practice that, that I have on metformin, and, uh, and they seem to be doing very well, keeping that, that glycemic load down. There was a uh, men's health article came out a few months ago now. Um, they interviewed me for because there's, there's this new combo drug idea of taking Ozempic, or I should say GOP-1 agonist, and testosterone to get jacked and shredded. And if you think about the way this works, that's my office, that's my practice, jacked and shredded. And uh, they, uh, these guys come in because they, they look amazing, but they want to look just a little bit more amazing. Problem is that these GOP-1 agonists can cause a little bit of sarcopenia. So the last thing you want if you're trying to get jacked is to lose muscle. So if you balance that with testosterone, you've got this amazing combination of something that's gonna keep you shredded, but keep the jack going. Uh, metformin is a lot cheaper and actually does pretty much the same thing and bodybuilders have been doing that for years. So that's my data is uh, Muscle Beach. I don't have a paper on that. Methylene blue is not just for vesicopedidinostomies, but it is a very interesting agent. Uh, agent. It actually has been used and there is a human trial on progeria as is in sirolima. So if you look at the the pathologic aging in that condition where, uh, where cellular breakdown happens the minute those, those uh, kids are born and their life expectancy is 13, we can throw anything we can at them. And we're starting to see a little bit of signal that methylene blue and sirolimus has a role in that. And it has to go into this idea of autophagy where we have to figure out why as we age, our cells are dying faster than they're turning back on. And that's something that we're gonna be starting to look for. Some of glutides, I think I went into that already, but I will say, you know, the most impressive data on this, and this I got from Marty Miner, who's a men's health specialist, he's a family medicine doctor, but knows more about men's health than, than most of us urologists. He, uh, he is just super hot on, on the GLP-1s because of the cardiovascular improvement. So the, the glucose reduction starts, right? And then the metabolic syndrome goes away. And if you look at all of the things that kill us, cardiovascular disease it usually goes back to metabolic syndrome. We're getting a handle on cancer, although that still kills us and you can't outrun those genes, but maybe you can, you can slow them down a little bit with the GLP-1. So, so I'm really hot on semaglutides as we get, um, move a little bit forward. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on NAD because again, I think this is the problem. 
So, and uh, I know Dr. Moha was going to uh, be here, and he couldn't, but I'm going to quote one of his studies, which I thought was one of the best studies ever on Peyronie's disease, where we've known for years that, uh, how many, well, no, I don't want to call anybody out, but, but the, the therapy we had for Peyronie's disease forever was what? Topical for Rapamil, right? Because Rapamil can improve uh, uh, the uh, plaque formation. So you put a little topical for Rapamil on, and then it gets down into the plaque, and then you're cured. And so John did this very elegant study where he took all these guys that were going to have a plaque excision and graft, put them on topical verapamil ahead of time, and then measured the amount of verapamil that got into the plaque, and it was zero. So the problem with NAD is this is such a prolific uh, enzyme. It's just a quick oxidative reductive action. Uh, and Oh, sorry. So I'm, I'll, I'll be done in a sec. And, and, and none of it ever ends up that whatever comes in your mouth or in the IV will end up in the cells. And so it's great because that's what really is the, the, the wheelhouse of aging is to keep your NAD levels up. They go down. We haven't figured out how to get them back up. All right, very quickly, these are the drugs that all men and women should consider taking. I did say women. It's not just a men's health talk. Tadalafil, finasteride, testosterone. I think we've already had enough talks about them. But this is what we do, and this is what we should think. Testosterone should be a building block of aging because it's one of the things that we know decline early on. And Dr. Walsh did a great job of saying how it's pretty safe to take. We have no good longitudinal data that it's effective to improve longevity, just a lot of people that have tried. I've already hit the side effects, so I'll get through that. And I, I'm going to have just one last talk on a slide on longevity and, and can it be equitable, because to me, that's a huge part of my practice, is trying to figure out how to, how to just sell my IP for zero. And, uh, and a lot of the clinical work I do is basically figuring out how to steward people through a generic drug market, lifestyle, nutrition changes. And all these drugs are generic. I mean, I can give my guys uh, five milligrams of Tadalafil a day, 90 day supply for 12 bucks. That can go anywhere. It's cheaper than anything out there. And it's probably one of the better longevity drugs out there. So the problem with this all, though, is if you want to be in, if you want to be in this world, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to do hyperbaric oxygen. It takes a lot of time to be in a cold plunge. It takes a lot of time. So it's hours and hours and hours. And so uh, I'm not going to go into the math of this slide, but essentially you, most of these longevity promises, if you're listening to the podcast, say we can add eight to 10 years onto your life, but it's going to take five years of actual time in real time of every day to get you those eight to 10 years. So you better love it. I'm going to leave you with Warren Zavon, who's one of my favorite musicians, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, which is basically when he found out he had metastatic mesothelioma and was going to die soon, enjoy every sand, which is what he told David Letterman months or weeks before he died. And his last song he wrote was called My, Ride, My Rides Here. And I just think the important thing about longevity is that we all got to go at some time, wherever it is. So we should be skiing as much as we can. We should be enjoying time with our family and maybe not spending three or four hours a day trying to live forever if you're going to miss the ride while you're here. So thanks very much. Thank you.